Hello, my name is Tamar Friedman, Senior Director of Programs at Jewish Funders Network, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's program on anti-Semitic attitudes across the ideological spectrum, a conversation with Dr. Eitan Hirsch, the 2022 Ilya Salida Excellence in Research Award winner. The Ilya Salida Excellence in Research Award was inspired by Ilya Salida Zal and Ilya's passion for informed data-driven philanthropy, and we're really excited that um, Dr. Eitan Hirsch was the first uh, recipient of this award for his study on um, that we're going to discuss today, like I mentioned before, the anti-Semitic attitudes across the ideological spectrum. Um, today, we will be able to have a dynamic conversation with Eitan and Karen Cohn, director at One Eight Foundation. Um, first, we will hear from Dr. Hirsch about, um, he will present his award-winning research and his key findings, and then we will have, have a chance to really have a conversation about how it can impact the Jewish community and philanthropy and inform our funding strategies. And with that, I would like to introduce Karen Cohn, director at One Eight Foundation, to get us started today. Thank you, Karen. Hi, it's so nice to see uh, some familiar faces. And I hope everyone is doing well and not suffering from these allergies that you'll hear me uh, <laughs> struggling with. I'm Karen Cohen from the One Eight Foundation, and we, along with our friends at the Klarman Family Foundation, were honored to support this research um, that Eitan and Laura, Roy Laura Royden um, completed um, on anti-Semitism. And it's a fitting tribute that Eitan received the inaugural Ilya Salida Research Award for this work. I had the privilege of getting to know Ilya over several years, uh, and he is someone who led with passion and with compassion, with knowledge and with instinct. Um, and I just smile every time I, I kind of uh, think about him. So we know a lot about anti-Semitism or Jew hatred as some of us prefer to call it. Anti-Semitism is old, yet it's new. It's left and it's right. It's from educated and non-educated. It's the denial of Israel's right to exist, yet not all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitism. If you know a Jew, you're less likely to be anti-Semitic, yet anti-Semitism rates are highest in areas where there are Jews. Jew hatred is real, and it's not included in most DEI work. And the best way to fight anti-Semitism is to strengthen Jewish community, but it's also to prevent violence, to change minds, to increase awareness, and many other things that we do every day. We could find research and data to prove or disprove any of the above. We could also embark on analysis paralysis, but today we have an opportunity to hear about some interesting research focused on young adults, 18 to 30, across the political spectrum. The insights Eitan and Laura derive from their research has been helpful to 1A as we think about our grant making strategy and has led us to additional research, including a study that we're completing with ADL and the University of Chicago. Eitan is an associate professor of political science at Tufts University. Um, the focus of his writing and teaching is on American politics, on US elections, civic participation and voting rights which I think makes his work um, even more interesting that, that this, he comes from it as an outsider uh, in, this, in this field. And um, he is the author of several books and you can learn more about him on his website. And his co-author, Laura Royden is here as well. And uh, I will turn it over to Eitan and um, allow him to take it from here. Okay, thanks, uh, uh, Karen, and thanks, Tamara. Thanks for organizing this. Um, it's nice to be with all of you. I'm going to try to boil down like what is now over 100 pages of research uh, across three uh, scholarly papers into 10 or 12 minutes, mostly to rush through in order to have a conversation and learn from everyone else here about what strikes you and, and, and what to do with this research. Um, but by way of introduction, I'll say just three things that motivated our work. Um, one is this desire to do what Karen said, which is kind of approach us from a disinterested perspective uh, without a, a, such a strong agenda about where we think anti-Semitism is and, and, and why it's there. Um, the second thing is to focus on young people for, for reasons related to uh, uh, how young people are developing their political consciousness on college campuses and elsewhere, what's going on on the young um, far right, 
and uh, in the in the world of the alt right, which is which is uh, kind of an online community is um, focused on young people. We focus the study on 18 to 30 year olds with uh, comparison to older folks. And the third kind of big motivator um, is that we were very interested in measuring anti-Semitism in different ways, both through overt, explicit measures and through more subtle forms of um, prejudice that come out through, uh, in our case, uh, studies of double standards. So let me go into the data. I'll share my screen and I'll just talk for a few minutes to share some of the, the highlights. Okay, so hopefully everyone can see my screen. Yeah, you can see? Okay, good. Um, so just to give you a sense of the data before we go too far into it, um, a lot of what we're gonna be looking at is, is an ideology measure, which is seven categories from very liberal to very conservative. And this graph here just shows you what does it look like when people respond to this survey about their ideology, both among young people and, old, and older people. Um, and what you can see is most people identify as moderate, the plurality of people identify as moderate, but young adults tend to be um, much more liberal. That is, they're twice as likely to be in this very liberal camp as uh, 31 plus year olds are. A last thing to notice here is that even though young people tend to be pretty liberal, um, still like 30% of people under 30 identify as conservative, and that population is going to become important to the study. Um, just a, a point of interest, we also asked all of our respondents um, how they, uh, if they identify with any of these categories, we call them ideological identities, they could list more than one, whether they identify as leftist or socialist, etc. And what we can see here is that young people are way more likely, like more than twice as likely to identify themselves as someone who is leftist or socialist, they're even more likely to identify themselves as alt-right. Um, uh, the only category that's way less common among young people are Christian conservatives. Okay, so let me show you the, the kind of the, 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 the big highlights of the study. The first comes from these overt measures of anti-Semitism, which we asked three simple questions, two of which come directly from the Anti-Defamation League's battery of questions. Jews are more loyal to Israel than America. Um, the bottom one is Jews in the United States have too much power. And then this new one is it's appropriate for opponents of Israel's policies and actions to boycott Jewish American owned businesses in their communities. Now we did some checks on these questions. Um, Jewish respondents, including young Jewish respondents, overwhelmingly agree that agreeing with these statements is, is anti-Semitic. Okay, so where do people line up? So let me just show you one, one interesting graph here. The gray lines here are people over 30, and the green are people under 30, or 18 to 30. And if you look at the middle graph to see what, what this looks like and how intensely different the young people are from the older people. Uh, if you ask people, is it okay to boycott Jewish businesses, about 10% of people on the left and about 10% of people on the right say it's okay to boycott Jewish businesses. That's among older people. And if you had just done a study of all adults, you would see something like no differences across the ideological spectrum. When you look at young people, you look at something very different, which is that the conservatives on the, uh, among young people are way more likely, way more likely to agree to these statements that it's okay to boycott Jewish businesses compared to folks on the left. And indeed, in all three of these measures, what we see is a much stronger ideological relationship where answers are the anti-Semitic response is lowest on the far left and quite high on the far right. Now, separate from this ideological effect, there's a big racial effect going on. And let me show you what that looks like. OK, so here I've divided the group into liberals, moderates and conservatives. And then by race, so white, black, Hispanic, other. Now, if you look at the, the groupings, like all of these people together on the liberals, you'll see that um, the percent to agree with one or more of these anti-Semitic statements is much lower among liberals than conservatives, which is what I showed you in the previous graph. But if you subset by race, as I do here, you see something striking, that among liberals, African-Americans and Hispanic respondents um, are, are way more likely, two to three times more likely to agree to these statements. And that's also true uh, among conservatives. Now keep in mind, about a third of young people of every racial group identify as conservative. And we here have evidence that the, the, most, um, the most extreme anti-Semitic attitudes or the most commonly held anti-Semitic attitudes are, are held among um, not just conservatives, but minorities who also identify as conservative. But again, you see a racial effect both on the left and on the right. 
Um, we, we did a lot of work in the study to show, to, to understand whether the anti-Semitic responses were tied to the Israel-Palestine conflict. Um, so let, give me, I'll give you an example of what that looks like. Uh, if you said, uh, if you agree to the statement, Jews have too much power, we asked you a follow-up question, which is why. Um, in what domains do you think Jews have too much power? Select all that apply. And we gave uh, people all these answer options and they could click all that apply. And we were interested here to know the following. If you said Jews have too much power, did you mean they have too much power over the Israel-Palestine conflict? Or did you mean basically that they, uh, did you, do you hold kind of standard uh, anti-Semitic views that Jews have too much power in news, media, entertainment, domestic policy, finance? We also asked about agricultural production, which as far as we know, um, there's no evidence of Jewish either over-representation on, on or, or any kind of conspiracy theories. We want to sort of see what it would look like if we asked about something that's not a, a sort of a classic anti-Semitic trope. And here's what we found. So did people who say Jews, Jews have too much power mean that they have too much power over the Israel-Palestine conflict? This red bar shows that only about 8% of people who said Jews have too much power just clicked the Israel-Palestine conflict. What mostly happened is that people who said Jews have too much power, they mean a bunch of these things. They mean Israel-Palestine, but they also mean most of all news media and entertainment and domestic politics and finance. So um, this is just one piece of evidence that what's going on in these attitudes about Jews is not really just a reflection of the Israel-Palestine conflict. I'll show you, just showcase one kind of study we did on double standards. So this is not the overt measures of anti-Semitism, but something that comes out of of double standards relative to other groups. So here's an experiment we did. Um, respondents saw this. In order to participate in social justice activism, half the respondents were told, Jewish Americans should unequivocally denounce Israel's discrimination against non-Jews. And then they could agree or disagree with that statement. Another random group was given a different treatment, and that was this. In order to participate in social justice activism, Muslim Americans should unequivocally denounce Muslim countries' discrimination against non-Muslims. Okay, so what we're looking for is whether, particularly on the left, um, far left respondents were more likely to say that uh, uh, Jewish Americans should denounce Israel than Muslim, Muslim Americans should denounce Muslim countries. And that is indeed what we found on the left. That is, if you look at the this these two dots right which represents 20 percent of young people under 30. um uh the blue dot is higher significantly higher than the green dot which just means that yes on the far left respondents are more likely to say that jews should denounce israel than muslims should denounce muslim countries uh and on the right you see the opposite basically an anti-muslim double standard on the right uh and an anti-jewish double standard on the the, the far left we did another double standard uh, experiment, and we see something similar where Jews are held to a different standard than Indian Americans. Um, so, but I don't have, I'm not going to show you that data just to be able to plow through this and get to and get to a discussion. Okay, so um, I showed you a, a couple of graphs about the overt measures related to the far right and to racial minority groups. Um, to double standard measures where we see some evidence of anti-Jewish double standards on the left. And now we'll just show you something that is related to Israel attitudes. So we asked a third of respondents this question, how favorable is your impression of each of the following countries or haven't you heard enough to say? And our, our, our plan here with asking about Israel was to ask about Israel in the context of other countries, some of which are US allies, some of which are U.S. adversaries. So we asked people to review their feelings, their sentiment about these seven countries. And if you look at the young far left, okay, so these are 18 to 30 year olds who are on the left, the 20% respondents who are the farthest left. What you see is that there is a group of countries, U.S. allies, Nigeria, India, and Mexico, for whom the majority have a favorable view. And then there's the four countries up here, which are three U.S. adversaries plus Israel, where the majority have a somewhat or very unfavorable view. Um, Israel is really grouped in much closer to the adversaries of the U.S., to Russia, China, and Iran, than the countries Nigeria, India, and Mexico. In fact, if I showed you the graph, that's not just the far left, but people who identify as socialists, again, 20% of respondents, Israel looks even more like the Russian 
the Russia uh, uh, row here, where it really is quite strong rates of individuals having a very unfavorable view. Um, if you look across the ideological spectrum, what you see is that this is again going from the on the seven point scale from far left to far right. Here are 18 to 30 year olds in green. Here are the 31 year old pluses in blue. And when you see that on both the left and the right, young people are less favorable towards Israel than people over 30. Right, so we have pretty you know, very negative views about Israel on the far left, um, but also relative to the folks on the on the uh, who are older, you have also less uh, positive sentiment on the right. Um, are the negative attitudes just about Israeli politics? That's what we want to answer in the in a second kind of experiment. So so again, first. This set of people I just showed you were asked this question, how favorable is your impression of the following countries or haven't you heard enough to say? Another third of our sample got a different uh, question wording, which is this, thinking about their politics and government, how favorable is your view of each of these countries? And the third group got this treatment that said, thinking about their languages, cultures, and religions, how favorable is your impression of each of the following countries? And we were particularly interested in group three here. Why? Because a lot of people don't like countries, politics, and governments, but we want to isolate the, 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 the question toward languages, cultures, and religions to see whether people would have a negative view about Israel, even when just thinking about that. We kind of thought that people in general would have a positive view of basically every country's languages, cultures, and religions, even if they have uh, don't like the politics. So here's what it looks like, um, again, 18 to 30 year olds versus 31 plus overall, the question about politics and the question about culture. So I already showed you this third of the graph. Here what we see is that young people across the ideological spectrum have a much lower rating of Israel on politics than older folks. And here on culture kind of surprised us. So here on culture, what we see is that the, the left, both young and old, only about half of them, like half of the people on the far left have a favorable view of Israel's languages, cultures, and religions. Half have a negative view. On the right, what you see is that the older right loves Israel's languages, cultures, and religions, but the young right is sort of similar to the young left. They're, they're, they're terror, tepid on it, par of views towards, uh, towards Israel's languages, cultures, and religions. Okay, so I wanna just finish up this uh, very quick tour of some of the findings, just to, to summarize the key insights. Among young adults, anti-Semitic attitudes are much more common on the right than the left. That's probably finding number one. F uh, relatedly, compared to the older right, the young right exhibits dramatically higher anti-Semitic sentiment. The young right is both less excited about Israel and much more willing to say anti-Semitic things than the older right. The next big finding is that outside the far right, the highest anti-Semitic sentiment is among African-Americans and Latinos. Um, young Latinos show much higher rates of anti-Semitic attitudes than older Latinos. It's the same young and old for African Americans. But among young people, African Americans, Latinos um, agree to the anti-Semitic statements at the same rate as the young alt-right. Um, the Israel-Palestine conflict is tangential to the anti-Semitism among all of these groups. That is the racial minority groups as well as the, the as the far right. That is, the anti-Semitism seems to be focused on standard anti-Semitic. Uh, uh, tropes, not just about a kind of politics around Israel. And the double standard measures, the bias against Jews in the far left is there, but we don't see that among Black and Latino respondents. When compared to other minority groups, including Muslim Americans, which I showed you a graph about, and Indian Americans, which we study, but I didn't show you the graph about, the far left has a double standard with respect to Jewish Americans and Israel. That is, compared to how the young left uh, views groups like Indian Americans or Muslim Americans, they do seem to hold Jews to a, a double standard. The young left uh, views Israel in the company of U.S. adversaries. They dislike Their dislike of Israel extends to Israel's cultures, language, and religions, not just its political leadership, right? That's reflecting that last graph, which showed that half of people on the, on the far left um, have not just a negative view toward Israel as a country or toward its politics, but also toward its languages, cultures, and religions. Okay, and with that, I am going to turn it back to Karen to facilitate a conversation. Again, I'm so sorry for the pace in which I just described all this, but it was really just to, to get through it so we can have a com conversation. Thanks, Eitan. If it's e if you could, do you co copy those five summary points maybe and throw them in the chat so people can reference if they 
if they want, that would be great. Um, we're really gonna take some time now and open it up for questions. Um, Eitan speaks quickly. I've heard him present many, many times. And I know that if I hadn't seen this data very, uh, very often, I would be like, huh, go back, can you? So um, please either raise your hand or put a comment in the chat, whichever you prefer, or just kind of, uh, I think I can see everybody, but would love to hear what kind of questions, comments, thoughts you have uh, for Eitan. Can we just talk a little bit about the, the, um... The sample and how you choose people and how you, um, you know, you ask all these questions. And one of the things that I wonder about is, are people honest? Is this even so much worse than what you're showing? So I'm curious how you think about that and um, how you approach the creation of your sample groups. Sure. Great question. Um, so the sample was through kind of the gold standard for online survey research, uh, the company's called YouGov, right? So we have a representative sample of the 18 to 30 year olds, and then a representative sample of the of the full adult population. And the way we approached the, the question that you're asking is that the, the survey went from kind of the least overt questions about Jews to the most overt, right? So um, when you were seeing as a respondent, the questions about here are seven countries, you know, that those seven countries, they were randomized in order, you wouldn't know that that's a study about, about Israel or Jews, right? Um, then when you got the experiments next, right? So you got the experiments about Indian Americans and there was one about Catholic Americans, you would have been in one of those groupings. So again, you wouldn't necessarily have known that there were questions about, that this was a study about Jewish people only until the very end when you were asked those overt questions, which I talked about at the beginning, but those are the questions that came last. Um, were there explicit questions uh, about about attitudes towards Jews? I think you're totally right that people um, either might might hide their at their true attitudes, and there's some work in psychology about trying to to you know doing experiments to try to to get at that. But um, I I think you you are also right that this might be sort of like the minimum because it's sort of shocking that this many people, right? Really, a huge number of people are perfectly willing to say. Yeah, Jews have too much power. It's okay to boycott their businesses. There might be many others who are hesitant to say that, um, but but think it. Uh, so, yeah. Can you, um, Eita, just speak just really briefly to the source of the data that you used and the confidence level that you have in in that date? Why you chose, um, not Ameris speak, but the YouGov data. For this? Yeah. So YouGov, there's a bunch of companies that do online surveys. Um, there's a few ways we can validate the quality of those online surveys. One really nice validation actually for this particular project is we asked the same exact questions in a couple of settings that the ADL had used on a, on a telephone survey. The telephone surveys are a lot more expensive. You have really low response rates. And we were getting the exact same rates of agreement as the ADL was getting with our online surveys as what the ADL was getting. So that's a, a point of confidence. Uh, in general, the way these surveys work are it's a little bit complicated, but basically they have a million people plus who are um, on their panel, so they know some information about those people. And then if you want to survey a representative sample of, say, young people or everyone, they know the number of people they need in a whole bunch of categories. Like we need to survey, you know, 10 uh, Hispanic women who are conservative and don't have a high school degree. And so, th and they put that together. And there's a lot of work that validates this against things that we can validate uh, surveys against like presidential election outcomes and things like that. And, and this is sort of the highest quality online survey that, that you can get. I guess uh, I didn't, I wasn't able to commit all the data to, to memory in the time we had, but you know, the impression I had from the data presented earlier was that the problem was bigger on the right than on the left, which I found a little bit counterintuitive, whereas the later data, which was more Israel focused, implied it was more on the left than on the right. Um, and I'm just wondering, is that impression accurate? And if so, how do you sort of think about reconciling that? And can you sort of locate where the biggest problem is on the spectrum? Or is it just different problems at different places on the spectrum? 
Yeah, that's a great question. So let, let me kind of summarize again where I think the three big findings are. In the overt attitudes about Jews, for sure, the far right people are willing to say, to, 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 to agree with anti-Semitic statements in the far left. And the young far right is sort of ground zero for this. Second thing is that um, there's a separate racial effect among African-Americans and Latinos that is totally separate from the ideological effect. That is among those on the left and on the right, um, minority uh, respondents are much more likely to agree to the anti-Semitic statement. So, uh, so in terms of the kind of the, the um, uh, just agreement, comfort level, just believing or sharing anti-Semitic attitudes, we have the far right and we have minority groups. Um, the double standard situation is on the left, uh, and it's relatively small compared to those other effects. But, you know, if we're at a place like where I work, Tufts University, a campus that's very liberal, most of my students are identify on the far left. So that's sort of like where the problem is, uh, where, where that kind of manifestation of a double standard emerges. I think our data is consistent with that. The Israel attitudes are in some ways quite distinct. That is, yeah, the far left really doesn't like uh, Israel. Uh, they see Israel as kind of an enemy. They don't agree on the, they don't agree to the, the statements that are like Jews have too much power or businesses should be boycotted, but they are, you know, they have what, you know, what we might think are like unusually negative views toward Israel relative to, to, um, to other U.S. allies. Um, the, the, po the folks who, who agree to the, 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 they don't like Israel's culture, those tend to be folks who also agree to the anti-Semitic statement. So if you look at the people, if you just look at the Israel questions, they say, do you not like the um, languages, cultures, and religions of Israel? Uh, if you don't like those things, you are more likely than not to also to agree to some of the anti-Semitic statements. So those, that's the relationship there. But just, yeah, there's a lot of folks on the left who don't agree to the anti-Semitic statements, but really don't like Israel. Um, thank you for sharing your research. It's really interesting to hear. One question I have, and I'm coming at it from a you know, philanthropy perspective of, um, did you look at any of the willingness to change perceptions among these groups? So for example, you know, is there low hanging fruits of groups that are willing to say, hey, you know, with a little bit of education, a little bit of pushing, we might have abilities to think differently versus those who are just, this is what I'm gonna think no matter what you do, I'm not going to change my mind. Um, that's a great question. So we haven't done that. There is, I think that is a, a like a logical next step for this research to think about interventions. I will say as like a point of interest that um, one of the interesting things happening on the, the far right is um, at least there's a hypothesis that there's a, a strong willingness to just sort of be anti-PC whenever, whenever given the opportunity to, to uh, a, a reactionary attitude toward political correctness, towards inclusion. And so you have on the right a, a, a great willingness to say sort of nasty things um, in a survey context um, um, or elsewhere to push people's buttons and, and, and so forth. And, and so one, question is how related to what you to your comment is essentially like how dug in are folks particularly on the right on those attitudes are they just sort of you know are they joking are they serious are they willing to really stand behind them um and so i think like getting into the psyche of the of the far right is particularly useful um given that that sort of the anti-pc hypothesis sorry um hi um i have a question regarding uh on the right, do you see that uh, the Christian conservatives, libertarians, the MAGA folks, uh, can you just sort of discuss which ideological subsets uh, are most likely to hold these anti-Semitic beliefs? Yeah, so, and actually Karen knows some, some about this because they, um, they, they've done some separate analysis with our data on religion. What, I, what I've noticed is that in all the subgroups, the, there is um, strong gratitude among among uh, the religious groups than the non-religious groups, but it's, you know, but it's it's there everywhere. That is like um, the anti-Semitic attitudes are high on the right among the non-religious and among the religious. Uh, African-Americans who are, uh, uh, and Latinos who have higher religious engagement than, um, than white Americans, uh, it's both among the religious groups and the non-religious groups that, that show like a higher racial effect. But Karen, did you want to add anything particularly yeah. to the conservatives? Yeah, uh, we had an intern last summer who took, um, we wanted to kind of 
break down that far right and to understand the Christian far right. And I'm sure a lot of you have seen, there's been quite a bit of writing um, recently about that. And so we took that and we analyzed it and it was kind of interesting. We, we found um, that the Catholic, the, the Catholic far right was much more anti-Semitic um, than we expected and more anti-Semitic than the evangelical far right. And this was not associated with traditional anti-Semitism, um, you know, the um, Christ, the, the Jews killed Christ. There was some real interesting subtlety there. And we went in a little bit deeper and we started to map what was happening among the far right, both the Christian far right, to understand who were their influencers, where were they getting information, and why were we seeing this shift among um, the, the right uh, young Christians. I'm happy to share some of that research with anyone uh, that's interested. You can get in touch with me through, um, through JFN, through Tamar, um, and I'm happy to, to send that off to you. But it was quite fascinating. And at first we weren't really convinced with what we were seeing, um, but, uh, but the data uh, really proved it. And, and, uh, and there was just an article yesterday, I think in the New York Times about the same topic. Now, one just thing, point I'll add to this uh, that's really interesting about the age effect among the right, right? Where the, the groups where you have um, pretty positive views towards Jews on the right are the evangelical groups, the older, the, you know, the older folks. It's really the young group, group is way less likely to be religious. Um, uh, that both has kind of tepid views about Israel and negative views towards Jews. I think this, this does speak to a hypothesis that swirls around, which is that the sort of the, the far right that's into Israel is anti-Semitic. And I think that the data is more consistent with a different hypothesis, which is that um, the folks who are getting a lot of pro-Israel messaging, maybe evangelical churches, are way less likely than the less religious or 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 or, or than groups like Catholics who are, don't have the same kind of pro-Israel relationships to agree to the anti-Semitic statements. I mean, I, 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 one, one thing to build on that is that what we learned is, you know, for Catholics, uh, the Holy Land is the Vatican, right? Whereas for evangelicals, they're going to Israel, they're engaging with Israel in a very different way than the Catholic community. So that is one of the reasons. <clears throat> but I, I should have said this before, but this really just is like kind of something that should, should kind of stick with us, which is that um, anti-Semitism in our survey, but not just in our survey, in other surveys as well, is is one of the a rare prejudice that is more common among young people than old people. That is, if you look at other forms of prejudice, if you look at um, anti-LGBT prejudice, if you look at sexism, racism, these these forms of prejudice are way more common, way more common among older people. In our survey, it's young people who are more likely to agree with these statements, um, and so uh, I, that does potentially relate to the to the uh, religious conviction because it's, we have a very non uh, uh, non religious young uh, electorate right now in the United States, but it's also just sort of a phenomenon a phenomenon that is hard to square in some ways with other forms of prejudice. I have been encountering for the past well it started about a year and a half ago, and it's more the young. It's also through the middle age, and. Uh, <laughs> somewhat into my age group. And something that is emerging, whether they're religious or they're non-religious or secular or whatever you want to call it. But through both of you, for you, Karen, and for you, is it Etan? Is that Etan, that's okay, Etan. Etan. Oh, okay, I'm trying to learn how to pronounce these. Uh, Etan, um, have you run into these theories, which I think are crackpot, but unfortunately I'm running into quite a few people. Um, the Quanon, is it Quanon or something like that? And this overlying thing, uh, the, you know, when they joke about, or some people don't joke about the white supremacist, but what is emerging in groups that I encounter on a regular basis where they never were involved in any of this. There's this new philosophy that somehow white men, not white women, but white men are disappearing. So uh, the findings that you had on the Latinos and the blacks did not surprise me. 
uh, but did in 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 all of this, including the religious in the the white group, are do you have any research that you're distinguishing between these? This is something that's new to me. Yeah, so I'll just say that you're asking a good question. I mean, I think that one of the directions this research is moving in partnership with Karen and, and other organizations is to, to understand the media diet a little bit more to understand like who, you know, the conspiracy theories that are backing some of the um, some of the attitudes on the on the far right. And again, trying to distinguish something that's very hard to distinguish, which is something uh, a kind of a fantasy way of thinking about conspiracy that's that's fun for people to be in these online communities and kind of joking about yeah. and how that translates into real and quite dangerous behavior sometimes. Well, I guess the, where my concern is the far right, right of our the far right and the far left are just way out there. They're fanatics. That's my attitude. What concerns me is I'm starting to see this in more of what you would say the old fashioned way, more towards the central tendency, the more moderate, you're seeing this emerging, or at least I'm seeing this in the last year and a half. But I've been, I've been retired for like 15, 20 years. So I've been out of sort of doing my own thing up until the last few years. And so I don't know if this is new among the younger generation, but I'm I'm seeing it start to overlap in the middle age and into my generation, which really surprised so, me. I mean, well, yeah, Will, I'd love to hear. So we we have, there is some, another big research project that Eitan is involved with. Okay, all the right. The University of Chicago wait. that's gonna, um, we'll talk about in a minute, which is, which is, you know, this was really interesting. We were kind of like, wow, this tells us something, but not a lot. Not, I mean, it tells us a lot, but we want to know more. Um, and it turns out that ADL wanted to update their um, research, which was like hadn't changed okay. for 50 years. So um, we engaged, um, Eitan is advising, the University of Chicago's uh, research group is leading a quantitative study. We just finished some qualitative research that was interesting. Um, and then the quantitative study is going to be, so I think for a lot That's of the questions I'm hearing, um, I, I will share a little bit and, and then we'll see if we have some other questions. What we did hear so far in some of the follow-up qualitative, I'll just share with everybody, um, is that um, uh, a lot of uh, what we're finding is there's a lot of a lack of knowledge about Jews. People don't know what Jews are. They don't know anything about Jews. We've done a really good job of educating people about the Holocaust, um, a very good job of educating people about the Holocaust, but they really don't necessarily have an understanding about Jewish history in America, about Jewish history in general, about the history of persecution that Jews have faced for thousands of years. So um, huge opportunity there to understand what is kind of, um, naivete. Um, and a lot of people don't know about Israel. I mean, we had some people in these qualitative who kind of, they're like, you know, is they confused Israel with Iran and Iraq and the I, the I country. Yeah, I, I've seen that for about the last 10, 15 years. Yeah. And I've seen the, well, I've seen the Holocaust denial since what, uh, late 70s. Yeah. You know, it shocked me. So do we have any, um, asked Eitan, um, do we have any data on gender, geography, socioeconomic status, or level of education? In, in a lot of research like this, including in ours, there's, the anti-Semitic attitudes are much more common among men, men than women. Um, that's pretty consistent across all the studies I've ever seen on this. There are slight geographic effects, so, so more um, in, in states where there are large Jewish populations, but, but not entirely. So, you know, that's a big hypothesis that comes up with the racial groups. Um, for example, whether uh, racial minorities in, the, in New York or in areas where there are large Jewish populations and then sometimes some like neighborhood frictions, whether this is the source of um, anti-Semitism among minority groups. And the data is really inconsistent with that theory. That is in states where there are basically no Jewish people, which is like 
more than half the states. There are very, very few Jewish people. You have high rates of anti-Semitism among minority groups in those states as well. So it's really not just concentrated um, uh, in the states with large Jewish populations. I, it, since you ran out of questions, I just sort of had a comment, a uh, real quick one, or, and a question for Eitan, not related to the CERB study, but also uh, about people not knowing the Jewish community, this is Jewish American Heritage Month. And so far I have seen zero events. Uh, for, for the Asian American Pacific Islander Month, I'm invited to at least 10 different events. And so I have no event to invite anybody to. So we do have the opportunity to educate people, but we're not taking advantage of it. You the can come to Boston and the Red Sox have Jewish uh, heritage night. Really? Yes, That's they do. wonderful. That's wonderful. Chicago, I haven't heard of anything, and I'm going to ask somebody later today. But I, I was curious what kind of reaction Aton had. Uh, we had some horrendous murderous events and one attempted murder event this over the past several days against the Asian American community and the African American tragedy. But I have been sort of stunned by so many commentators, including Reverend Al Sharpton, who now is including the Jews when they talk about all the hatred going on. And it seems like it's there's a shift there where it was mainly other, the other ethnic and uh, racial groups. Have you noticed that at all this past weekend? Um, well, I think what we saw again, um, with the latest mass shooting that anti-Semitic conspiracy theories are wrapped up with a lot of, you know, with anti-immigrant sentiment, with racist sentiment. And so I think it's hard to, you know, just like in Charlottesville, there's a white nationalist rally that's that's focused on racial minorities and immigrants, but they're, there they are shouting, uh, Jews will not replace us. So um, I think that sometimes there is um, uh, a, a sense of, um allyship around those issues and, and and sometimes not and sometimes not so i think that you know my goal here in terms of if you know to the extent that we have an, a goal beyond just providing good solid academic research is that conversations around what is often a very very difficult topic can start uh with an anchor of a, of a shared starting place that is look it's really hard to have conversations about anti-semitism related to israel on campus where i am it's hard to talk about the issues as they relate to minority groups and so i think when we start by saying okay well like here's what the data are let's let's talk through it what does it mean how do we interpret it how do we understand it what can we do about it it becomes a a much more inclusive and um and i think productive conversation than when when it's held outside of any anchor point um, with research so so that's what i'm hoping but i, I totally agree that i think it, it, um uh we are in some more sometimes particularly with the, sort of the growth of the far right we're seeing we're seeing um connections that we didn't see before hey Ty, could you just in, in our last bit of time what we wanted to do is just share a little bit about okay so what do you do with the research right we could all get um consumed by by data but how do you kind of make that more actionable or do something with the insights um Eitan, can you share from your perspective i'm happy to share from the foundations what how we're thinking about using it but what are some of the applications i know you put at the end of your research some thoughts about what to do with this how would you want to think about framing um, where to take some of these insights? Sure, so I'll give just two brief reflections on applications. One is internal to the Jewish community where there is there are often conversations about anti-Semitism and then those conversations sometimes uh, become very unproductive when there's just about, well, here's what's happening on this political side or on that political side, and here's this anecdote on one side, and here's another competing anecdote on the other side. I think this data can help, um, again, set an anchor of, well, what do we see in the population? What do we care about? I think there's, um, it's easy to, to, it's easy to, 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 to come to the conclusion, I think, which is what our data suggests, which is that there is a big problem with um, anti-Semitic white nationalism on the far right in this country. At the same time, there is a problem closer to home, like on my college campus and other similar campuses, where 
through our double standards and Jewish students feeling um, feeling uh, really uncomfortable and 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 called out and make and it's hard for them to sort of live full Jewish lives without being constantly uh, focused on the Israel Palestine question. So I think both those things are true, and and so I don't think we need to have this as an argument about what's more important. I think the data shows where the the relative uh, troubling trends are. Similarly, I think so. So I think that in the Jewish community, I think that data is really useful for that conversation. I think in a, in a campus environment like where I am, the data is really helpful for a similar reason, where is uh, where you know the student groups are often having really unproductive conversations about Israel Palestine. In our own campus, the the Palestinian students have said they don't want to even have a conversation with anyone like J Street who wants a two state solution. They don't want conversations with anyone who who um, who supports any kind of Jewish state in Israel. And I think that having political science data about, okay, well, what is anti-Semitism and, 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 you know, what are the, the values that come to evaluating other countries and how do countries stack up against one another? Again, hopefully it's helpful to facilitating better, better conversations and, and better education in the classroom. So from where I sit, those are the, the, the two points where I, or I hope to be able to weigh in. And I'll just add, and I'd love to hear if others have examples. Um, <clears throat> one of the things we've been doing a lot of uh, thinking about is supporting organizations that are engaging the progressive community in Israel conversations. So engaging uh, Jewish progressives organically within the community um, who are in relationship with other progressive organizations. There's a great group called Project Shema um, out of Chicago, some of you may know. And we've been in some conversations. They, um, they're, they and their network do training for um, organizers and, and Jewish progressives uh, to engage in these conversations around Israel in progressive circles. Um, that's one example. Another is we've been looking at how do we support progressive organizations or leaders who want to bring some um, progressive uh, faith leaders or civil rights leaders to Israel on, on trips. Um, and there are some organizations that are, are doing that kind of work. Um, as I mentioned before, we, we looked at the right and there's some similar efforts on the right. Um, some organizations that are deep in the evangelical and Catholic space have begun to test more and more with this kind of far right group um, to understand what it means to engage them in conversation and also in travel to Israel. Um, I think, um, is it not Philos? Um, Oh my gosh, I'm blanking. Anyway, there are some organizations that do that as well. Um, and then there are many organizations that are doing deeper research into one of the populations that Eitan uh, has talked about. So Fuente Latina, some of you may know, um, has done some really good qualitative research and is now designing some campaigns focused on the Latino community. Um, and, um, and as I mentioned, we're doing some research and we hope we'll be able to learn more about all of these, these subpopulations. Do people have other questions or thoughts um, around any of these topics or what they'd like to kind of see? Anything else for Eitan before we, before we break? I did put a link in the chat to Eitan's research. There are two separate papers, uh, one on anti-Semitism and one on, on Israel just pulling those two apart. Yep, and we have another one on race, which I don't think I post on my- It's not um, on your site yet. Yeah. Uh, we'll, get, we'll get to that. Great. Well, I'll just say thank you everyone for joining us. I want to, Laura's here hiding behind uh, the- um, <laughs> Yes, uh, behind yeah, her picture. <laughs> uh, Laura Royden, who's, uh, Laura's getting a PhD at Harvard in, uh, in government and, and worked as uh, a co-author with me in designing, designing all of these studies. Um, but I, I really want to just thank all of you for being here and also for supporting research like this. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's really good to be able to, to do this kind of research and, um, and bring it to, the, to audiences who care about it and hopefully inform conversations and investments based on what we can learn. So thank you so much. 
Can I just build on that just really quickly as a fund, as a foundation professional? I think what's really important is we didn't design this research. It wasn't our research to prove or disprove. Uh, we, you know, Aton had an idea and we were, we were lucky enough to fund it. And so I agree, fund research and fund independent research. Um, I think that's one of the most effective things that we can do as, um, as foundations and philanthropists. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Thank you, um, Eitan, for, for diving into this difficult topic and making it understandable and making it in a way that we hopefully can use it to, to create strategies to make impact in this issue. And I want to also thank Natasha, who is here um, representing Genesis. And thank you, Natasha, for being a partner in the Ilya Salida award and and helping just like karen said of of making sure people understand the importance of funding research and doing that in honor of the memory of Ilya is really special so thank you so much and having dr Eitan hirsch and his um and his colleague laura be our first winners has really been a joy and i think has set a really wonderful precedence for for going forward for, for other winners. So thank you. And thank you all for joining today and looking forward to continuing learning with all of you.